Hi there, and welcome back to Context Free. Today, I'm excited to welcome guest Don Syme, the designer of F Sharp, a functional programming language for the .NET platform and a companion to C Sharp. And as usual before my interviews, I'm going to show a demo of the language. I'll be using the Avalonia Funk UI library, which I can use in F Sharp because F Sharp integrates with the .NET ecosystem, including the Avalonia UI library. I pulled the demo today straight from a template from Avalonia Funk UI. And it also uses the Elmish library, which brings an Elm style of user interface code to F Sharp. Elmish is also usable with Fable that compiles F Sharp to JavaScript. But the demo today is going to be with desktop UI on Linux. The main program is in this file. I'll look a little bit closer at this counter FS to see how the library works. Here we've created a module with discriminated unions that can also work as algebraic data types. Note that we have an indentation based syntax and pattern matching and type inference as well. And it has to be of type state here. And so if you're familiar with the kind of ideas in Elm or React, you'll see here how the view gets created from the state. And then the events go back and update the state again. Let's run it. And we see here our counter. Plus, 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 minus, 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 and reset goes back to zero. Of course, F -sharp is useful for all kinds of server features as well or anything that .NET is good for. So having seen the demo, let's go on to the interview. Like all my interviews, I edited it after the interview and then added the visuals myself. Let's get started. To start with, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, my name is Don Syme and I am the designer of the F -sharp programming language. I have worked at Microsoft Research for over 20 years and yeah, I've had a long and happy career helping deliver programming solutions to developers worldwide. Prior to that, I did my PhD at the University of Cambridge and originally I'm from a country town in Australia called Toowoomba. I guess the first moment of real interest in programming languages was when my school teacher at about age 11 explained the logo language to me. And ever since then, I've been fascinated by programs, by what they mean, what they can be, the semantics of programs, logics associated with them, and all the actual practice of programming all the way through to production and delivery. My current responsibilities are, well, the F-sharp programming language, first of all, and I'm also doing a lot of work on AI programming models. Using F-sharp, though, many of the lessons are applicable more generally as well into Python and other programming frameworks. Awesome. Thank you. Going to a focus on F-sharp itself for now, how did F-sharp sure. get started? Okay, I joined Microsoft Research in 1999 from my PhD. And this was the very start of the .NET framework. I was at Microsoft before C Sharp was called C Sharp. It started off as a language called Cool. And I saw the framework being designed. Now, I was also involved in academia. And in academia, of course, functional languages have long been very popular for lots of good reasons. Academics tend to get a lot more choice over what they get to use for their implementations and for what they get to work on. And they like to work on things that are elegant, that capture the essence of programming and computation from certain angles. So I was associated with many researchers working in this kind of zone. And of course, it hadn't escaped the attention of these researchers that functional languages were not the dominant paradigm. In fact, object-oriented languages were the big dominant paradigm that emerged during the 1990s. And not just academics, but different advocates of functional programming had kind of different responses to what I call the object-oriented tidal wave that came through the industry in the 1990s with C++ and Objective-C and Java. And every language basically was trying to make their language object-oriented. But that didn't really work for these functional languages. Well, some people took that approach to make the functional languages more object-oriented. Some people took the other approach and say, we're going to take all these functional language features and we're going to put them into mainstream languages. We had people like Martin Odersky and Phil Wadler working on a system called Pizza, which was going to take Java and extend it with a whole range of functional language features. And we also had people who said, well, we want to keep functional programming the way it is. And we want to make these functional languages unchanged, more or less. 
run on the JVM. We want to make a functional language run on .NET. And I was very keen on functional languages and OCaml in particular was my language of choice. And another variation on that called Moscow ML, which implemented the standard ML programming language. And Microsoft at the time cared a lot about getting different languages to run on .NET. There was Windows and people needed to program Windows and Microsoft wanted to control the way that people programmed their platform. Yeah, there are good reasons for that when you look back at the history. So as part of doing that, they said, well, we actually really do want .NET to be a unifying force where it could run Visual Basic, it could run C++, it could run C Sharp, it could run potentially Java as well. And as part of the, in a sense, the marketing associated with that, they also decided to bring in other programming languages into .NET to make it one big happy family. And those of us at Microsoft Research working in programming languages said, oh, well, that's an interesting opportunity. Why don't we take our favorite languages and make them run on .NET? And in fact, some people in the group at Microsoft Research in Cambridge uh, had actually already a lot of experience with taking standard ML and making it run on Java. And so we thought, well, maybe we can just replay that. We can just take standard ML and make it run on .NET. F Sharp didn't exist at the time, but we were faced with this sort of question, how to get our languages to run on .NET. And there were many successes, but there were also frustrations. And those frustrations come around about some of those languages hadn't really advanced enough for my liking. Standard ML was a language from the 1980s. And so I eventually decided that I wanted to take the OCaml programming language and get that experience of programming that was represented by OCaml. And I wanted that in the .NET family of languages. And then I thought to myself, okay, we could do a camel.net. Then I thought that doesn't sound like it's going to be so compelling. And then I thought, right, okay, F, C, F, what, F sharp, why not, why not call it F sharp? And that was around 2003 as a very, very early prototype. And I guess I had some key conversations on the OCaml mailing lists about what I was trying to shape and understood that it seemed pretty reasonable that we wanted to really focus on very smooth interoperability through to the .NET and C Sharp. And then I guess it took about three years for F Sharp to really kind of take shape. And that's how F Sharp got started. And we talked to the product teams at Microsoft. They really liked what they saw. We did a bit by bit. We got various people on board, not everybody by all means. And eventually, Microsoft made a decision to actually include F Sharp in the supported family of languages in Visual Studio. And everything after that is another story, which is covered in my paper, The Early History of F Sharp. And lots of interesting anecdotes. I, I've given a brief summary of the first part of that history up until around 2010. Well, make sure to give some pointers to that when I post the video. Okay. So to me, it's interesting how in all this family of languages and the common language runtime, it was JScript and Visual Basic that Microsoft was really pushing as the companions to C-sharp to begin with. But by now it seems like after C-sharp, F-sharp is the most important thing on .NET. Is there a really quick story of how that transition occurred? Yes, it's an interesting thing that F-sharp has maintained its vitality it's a tricky balance. You have to be close enough to C Sharp. That interoperability is very good. But you also have to be different enough that you're bringing a lot of added value to the platform. Now, F Sharp is different in syntax in a ways that once you get used to it, it actually brings a lot of value and makes it very succinct and tight and efficient programming. And it also brings value in terms of methodology that the functional first methodology that is used in F Sharp are uh, where it's really the focus on data and sort of the transformations over data really do shine. It also brings huge value in terms of succinctness and type inference. When you write F Sharp code, you put very few type annotations. It's a lot like writing Python, but it is still strongly typed because nearly everything is type inferred. That was a key property we were bringing from OCaml all the way through. So F Sharp has really stayed the distance and it's brought a huge number of ideas into the .NET ecosystem and also attracted very different kind of people into the ecosystem with different ways of thinking about programming. When you look at JScript and Visual Basic, I mean, I've got huge respect for Visual Basic. I know it's much maligned as a language, but you know, I have spoken to many people whose first programming experience was Visual Basic. And my first programming experience was basic. It was sort of Apple basic and CPM basic or something before that. 
So Visual Basic, it was an incredible rapid development experience, and it was an absolutely key part of the success of Windows. F Sharp, because it came from the functional programming world, which was perhaps more dominant in the Unix part of the world, bringing it into the Windows system was actually a bit countercultural because the Windows ecosystem has something like Visual Basic, which is all about getting data from the database to the screen, building your forms, applications, you know, that era of 1990s, early 2000s programming for making the line of business applications. And I mean, millions of them were made all over the world. Visual Basic was just a huge thing. And so .NET has actually stayed the distance in an interesting kind of way. And initially it's this programmability solution for Windows, and now it's very cross-platform, very uniform experience across Linux and Windows. And why is it like that? Well, that's because of the cloud, because of Azure. And so I think that that shift in .NET to be no longer focused on Windows programmability, but rather on server-side cloud programmability, is a key part of why Visual Basic is becoming a little bit different in a cultural setting. There are lots of Visual Basic programmers still, by all means. And uh, yeah, and so in the end, it's really primarily C Sharp and F Sharp today. And I also think it's a very happy situation to end up in. Awesome. So how does F Sharp governance work? Sure. So there's several levels you can answer this kind of question at. Firstly, there's not that much governance is needed. F Sharp is open source and cross platform, and it's got a very generous license. Everyone can contribute to it. Now, the question is who is responsible for delivering F Sharp in its key ways that it gets delivered? Well, the great thing is that F Sharp is actually part of .NET as part of the .NET SDK. The F Sharp compiler comes as part of the .NET SDK. And this is delivered just like any other SDK. Microsoft make and deliver those open source packages. Now, on the language design side, the community, which is particularly the F Sharp Software Foundation, are in a sense spiritually sort of in charge of the design of F Sharp. And we run the design process for F Sharp out of the repositories of the F Sharp Software Foundation, FSLang uh, design and FSLang suggestions. In the end, those get implemented through pull requests to the .NET F Sharp, which is a repository of the .NET Software Foundation, which is a larger kind of nonprofit organization for .NET more generally. And those software foundations are primarily about managing open source issues, managing some community structures, and they're also about programs for diversity and for speakers and community events and so on. And they have elections every year for the .NET Software Foundation. Anyone who's a member can vote in those elections for the .NET and the F Sharp Software Foundations, and you can be part of the board of those foundations. That's great. You already mentioned a little bit about object-oriented versus functional dichotomy and or combinations that people might have done in the past or whatever. But we've also have watched C-sharp as well as other languages become more functional over time. So how does F-sharp, do you think, does it contribute to that overall trajectory of C-sharp or does F-sharp contribute to the direction of .NET in other ways? So the answer is most Definitely, yes. For the purposes of making this an entertaining show, I'll be quite radical and say that really F Sharp owns the minds of the of the designers of C Sharp. F Sharp owns C Sharp in some way. When you look at the trajectory of C Sharp, so much has been about taking things from the design of F Sharp. And they also look at other programming languages. But the whole direction of movement in C Sharp ever since C-sharp 1 has been about bringing in these more and more functional style of features 